Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm sure you will agree with me. There were some interesting comments. Some may have made us slightly more relaxed. Some of may, may have made us slightly more stressed. Um, so it's my privilege to essentially offer a response to some of the minister's inputs. Um, we do some work here at Gibbs in what's called the Centre for Leadership, Ethics and Dialogue, where we bring together government, business, labour, civil society, to talk about uh, pressing issues in the country. And we've done a study on what we think is going to happen with uh, the NHI, broadly with the health system, to try and assist business and other actors in the system to respond to this. Of, uh, what, what I found very interesting is that the minister repeated the words, we want, uh, very often, and repeated the words, the system must, very often. Which, of course, points to the political agenda of what we want to see happen in the country and the expectations of what the system then, in response, must do. But, of course, the reality is that this has to take place within a real context with some real challenges, some real existing stakeholders. And so what we have tried to do with this work is to think through, uh, is to think through what some of those implications might be and how we might think about the future of pharma, the future of funders, the future of providers in South Africa. Uh, if we look at it in the short term, we're really talking about the status quo, uh, the situation as it is. In the medium term, uh, as the minister himself said, can the stakeholders engage each other? Can they find consensus? Can they find roles for each of the stakeholders to play? And then more importantly, can they be what we call sort of a level of co-creation? where government, business, and civil society come together to find each other in this process. Uh, my own view uh, in our current evaluation is that we're not doing the kind of engagement that is going to lead to co-creation. And so in the absence of that, we're likely to see a more combative approach. But I think there is room for this, as the minister called it, conversation to develop to get us to this long-term aspiration. And whether that's at NHI, we will see uh, how that develops. Now, let me start by saying we did not only speak to people within South Africa. We had a futurist out of the UK uh, give us input on what we see for the future of health, not just in South Africa, but globally. And I think the key takeouts from that, the major sort of mega trends, are three. The first one is e health. This is something most of us know about the, the role of technology in healthcare, uh, remote medical advice, etc. The second one, very interesting, is open innovation. This is an environment where, especially around medical devices, but also around targeted medicines, we're starting to see citizens and micro-businesses using things like 3D printers uh, to generate medical solutions that are not done by the private sector in the big corporations and not by, done by the public sector, but done by these innovative startups and venture capital going in that direction. And of course, when you add the third trend of body sensors, wearable devices, this creates a very interesting environment in the next five to 10 years where healthcare starts to become something quite personal, something that lives on a platform, something that is highly digitized. And we do know that there are South African companies beginning to play effectively in the space, but it raises important questions for the state about how we think about this, these kinds of opportunities in government and whether South Africa's government is alive to these types of opportunities. Now, that's the good news. The slightly more negative news is the environment in South Africa in which the NHI would have to be implemented. Uh, we're going to look at that by looking at the political, economic, and social trends. If we look at the political trends in the country, uh, the minister himself alluded to some of it around uh, differences of ideological opinion. But really what we're seeing is three trends. The first one is political fracture in our political parties, in the political formation in the country. That political fracture has implications for the policy environment. We're seeing some institutional reform around the NPA, through the Zondo Commission, some of the rebuilding of our state institutions, and we're seeing the rise of populist policies and a shift towards more populist policies. So on the political side, somewhat negative in the short to medium term. On the economic side, this is not news to us, uh, there is low growth. Uh, there is fiscal fr fragility. South Africa's uh, fiscal deficit is now above 4%. If we have very low tax revenue, that fiscal deficit will widen. And that adds then to South Africa's uh, debt burden, which puts us at risk in October of an economic downgrade. So we can talk about NHI. We can say the, the, uh, from a political point of view, we want 
And we can say the system must, but at some point we have to contend with the political and the economic realities that we face in the country. The third major area around the social trends is that South Africa, as we know, has a young, socially vulnerable population that is structurally uh, unequal. Um, I think my colleague Morris mentioned 10 million, I think it's 11 million people of working age who are unemployed. In addition to the 11 million, 17 million are on social grants. And so when we talk about bringing an NHI to South Africa to give everyone equitable health care, in the short term, in the medium term, we are going to have to deal with the political, economic, and social realities. Now, what does that look like when you put that all together? At the moment, South Africa is stuck in what we've described from a futurist perspective in a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle where the social inequality and social exclusion drives the political fracture, which drives the slow growth and the fragility from a fiscal point of view. If we don't begin to deal with this, this vicious cycle puts us in a position where we start getting into dangerous territory for downgrades. Now, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We don't know if it's an oncoming train. But the Ramaphosa reform agenda that we see here around institutional reform is starting to show flickers of positive uh, impacts. I listened to the, uh, to the president's speech in Japan last night. And this morning, uh, uh, talking to investors at the G7, talking to investors, I've read Tito Mbueni, the Minister of Finance, uh, growth uh, policy that came out in the last 12 hours. There's some flickers of light. Now, if that, if that positivity comes through, that will likely start to improve business confidence. But that only happens by 2020. That business confidence will drive investment. By 2021, we can start to see substantive investment. That starts to gr drive growth by 2022. And that starts to produce jobs by 2023, 2024, over the next 10 years. Now, in that environment where we're creating jobs on the back of investment, we're starting to see upward mobility in our population. And that starts to drive social cohesion. And then we're starting to, to put it in a term, then we're starting to fix the country. This is a five to 10 years process to, to 15 years. Someone mentioned the nine lost years, but they haven't mentioned the nine years of recovery to get South Africa back to where we were a decade ago. Now, that's if we get everything right. If we don't get everything right, there is, of course, another agenda that is trying to play itself out, which we've called the radical agenda, for lack of a better term. That agenda, if it increases the populism, will lower business confidence in October, will, November will likely lead to a downgrade, which will lead to divestment. In our analysis, what that will do is lead to a currency crisis where the currency will weaken between 10, 15 to 20 percent, hopefully 10 percent. Now, in that environment, there's not going to be any NHI. That will be a white paper, again, sitting on the shelf somewhere for five to 10 years. In that environment, what that will do is increase what we call relative deprivation and increase social polarization, which drives political fracture. So South Africa has to really choose which of these two directions we are going to go in, and this happens in the next three to six months. Uh, it's really part of whether, the, whether Ramaphosa can deliver on his agenda. Now, what does that look like for the economy, and we're talking at a national level, and then we'll come down to the health system itself, where all of us are, of course, highly invested. In the next one to two years, we think we'll be in a 0.6 to 1.1% growth environment. Uh, in the Minister of Finance's report last night for growth, uh, these figures are, are mirrored in that report. We're looking at 1%, 1.1% at best. That's if we deal with our fiscal deficit and our debt burden. If we successfully deal with them, we have to, at some point, make a decision here, 2021, whether we restructure that debt in the form of a bailout or a Chinese loan, which politically would be unpalatable, or whether we deal with it internally in the country. The minister has said, we do have the money in the country to deal with the problem. It's called prescribed assets. It's basically saying, let's take the pension funds to plug the hole while we grow the economy, and then we'll put the pension funds back to where they were. Now, this is a decision that we will make as a country. Depending on how we make that decision, we might get into a 3% growth environment in five years on the back of a pro-growth fiscal conservatism and investment drive. I do think, I can confidently say, I think the current president and those who support him have this vision. Having said that, if we handle this fundamental decision wrong, we get back down into a 0.6% growth environment. In that environment, it's unlikely that we'll see an NHI. Again, this plays itself out for political realignment in 
uh, in about five years' time, how we manage that, and whether we can fix the governance issues in the country to get us to this high growth environment. Now, I want to take the last few minutes against that backdrop at a national level to talk briefly about the, 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 the health system itself. First of all, what we've done in this study is we've looked at the ecosystem of health. Now, I know this is a complex slide. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, except to say, of course, the providers, the funders, the suppliers all work together around the regulation and policy brought about by the state. And what the minister is basically saying is we are going to introduce an NHI that's going to fix the problems in the system. Now, to put it quite bluntly, we think the minister wants to solve the right problems, but with the wrong set of instruments. Why do we say that? Very simply, we've looked at the Presidential Health Summit, all the inputs that were made there. We've looked at the market inquiry, all the inputs that were made there. And we've looked at what the, what the, the politicians have as their political ideals, but what the society is saying are the realities on the ground, the governance issues. Essentially, we have governance issues in every single aspect of what it would take to run an effective institution. Now, on the back of that, that leads us to say, this issue of a health system where... 80% of the population is serviced by the public sector at a fraction at 25% of the revenue versus the private sector. That has to be solved. That problem of inequity in the society has to be solved. But we don't think the NHI in its current formulation is going to solve that problem. Let me finish by saying why. The current dynamics in the market is the following. In the private sector, we have market dominance by both the funders and the hospitals. That market dominance produces resource centralization like specialists, doctors, and money. That resource centralization drives up the cost, which leads to an environment where we have very costly but quality healthcare in the private system. Now, the private sector better address that, otherwise the politicians will come and address it for us, right? In the public sector, we have major governance failures leading to inefficient resource use, which also drives up the cost and escalates medical negligence cases. And what that leads to is costly but poor quality outcomes. And then the assumption is that an NHI, which is a funding mechanism, will fix these problems. We don't think that's the case. And let me finish with this last slide of where I think this will end up going. What do I think the outcomes will be? Very briefly, and I'm going to touch on them quickly, and of course we'll be happy to share the slides for discussion after the conference. We think the NHI will be held up in a medico-legal battle for the for a protected period because of these issues. We think that the fiscal constraints on the country will prevent us from uh, doing this kind of large-scale health provision. We think that there will be this provincialization of the politics of procurement. That's a nice way of saying uh, provinces will rally for access to the, the procurement opportunities. We think that there will continue to be rent-seeking behavior by firms who are capable of localizing manufacture. We think that there will be some vertical integration by the major funders as they try to retain revenue in this environment. There will be disruption of the value chain by tech-enabled startups, and there will be rising pressure by advocacy groups. Now, what will that do to the system if we look at the ecosystem? We think that some medical practitioners will say, I want to look for alternative prospects outside South Africa. Number two, that the funders are likely to respond by providing innovative new models for servicing segments of the market that they haven't serviced yet, which will mitigate some of the pressure on the system. And then thirdly, that providers are likely to reorganize their services, in other words, hospitals, reorganize their services because they have to deal with what we would describe as mandated access, where they are essentially told they have to service certain segments. And then let me finish, I know we're going to go to the panel, let me finish by saying, I think that the focus needs to shift fundamentally to something quite different. Number one, I think that the focus should be on capacity building in the health system, in areas like delivery, social scientific innovation across the system. Number two, I think that that focus has to be done through public-private partnerships in resource training, targeted management and delivery. In other words, the private sector has to come alongside the public sector and say, we are going to help you fix health. The third piece, and this is very important, I think that the, the public sector should focus on the data and information backbone for an NHI. They should build that muscle and that capacity in the short term, but they should look at NHI as something they work towards in 10 years as they build the capacity in partnership with the private sector. Thank you very much.